on! Now we're talking about the 80s! The most radical decade ever, dudes and dudettes! This is the history of rock and roll! MRC proposal is an ill-conceived piece of nonsense which Yeah, fails yeah, to yeah, nobody cares. The 80s was the best decade ever. It rocked so hard. It's all about guitars and drums and Axl Rose screaming, yeah, and Nikki Six drinking heroin out of a fire hose and MTV and Transformers and Robotech and and All right, I gotta be honest with y'all, I really don't like the 80s all that much. What? Not that there weren't some great songs and albums that came out in this decade, but to my ear, the 80s is so over the top and superfluous. While the spectacle element of rock and roll began in the 70s, the 80s is where it just became a parody of itself, especially with music videos overshadowing records, which we'll get into later. I such BS. You know, I knew you were going to have something to say about this magical decade. So you know what? I came prepared. I do my research too, pal. Do you know what classic album came out in 1980? What? Back in Black by ACDC. Is that a cassette? Why, yes it is! I gotta say, going from vinyl to cassettes feels like a big step backwards. Come on, man. All the cool kids in Brooklyn are doing it. I have no idea why. Hey, just shut up and listen. Back in Black is such an awesome album. If you watched our extras video, you'll know that ACDC had a ton of awesome tunes in the 70s. We're talking TNT, Dirty Deeds, I'm on a highway Okay, to hell. okay. With the tragic death of Bon Scott, the band recruited Brian Johnson and paid tribute to their fallen leader with this rock and roll masterpiece. The guys wanted to be a, a, in memory of Bon, but without the slabber, without all the mulch and the crap that usually goes with that. Hey, The album has tons of classic songs like Hell's Bells, Shoot to Thrill, You Shook Me All Night Long. In fact, it's on here. Let me fast forward. Okay. Oh, wait. Still on Back in Black. Hold on. I like your hair, by the way. Um, where'd you get it done? Bandana's cool, too. Um, okay, this should be it. Oh, wait. Hold on. I gotta rewind it. It's not at the beginning. Oh, for God's sake, just show the clap for you! It should also be mentioned that Back in Black is a big step forward in terms of production. The sound of the guitars, the heavy drums and bass, Johnson's ballsy vocals were all really brought to life thanks to Mutt Lang's production. You know, he said you get great guitar sounds and that sold me and Malcolm straight away. Okay, I admit, Back in Black is a great album. But there's you a do lot know of what other album came out in that very same year? What album came out that same year? Blizzard of Oz! Black Sabbath behind, this is when Ozzy really cemented his status as the Dark Prince of Rock and Roll. And where the famous story of him biting the head off a vampire bat comes into play. Somebody threw a bat on stage, and I thought it was one of these toy bats. So I picked it up, bite the thing's head off, and suddenly everybody's freaking out because it's a real bat. As opposed to Black Sabbath, who were still carrying on the dark, heavy metal sound without him, Ozzy's solo material was much more radio-friendly, but it still rocked pretty hard thanks in part to Randy Rhodes' guitar solos. <laughs> And if it's more dark heavy metal you want, I got another classic from that very same year. Breaking the law, 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 breaking the law. It's almost like Batman is singing this. But Batman doesn't break the law. Well, in this version, he dies. And I know how much. 
much you love the police. I know, Zenyana Mandana came out that same year. Yeah! <laughs> How about Joy Division's new wave hit, Level Tear Us Apart, sadly released after the loss of their singer, Ian Curtis? And hey, uh, just so this year isn't a total sausage fest, uh, you're a fan of Pat Benatar, right? Oh yeah, she was like a rock goddess of the early 80s. Yeah, yeah. Well, turns out we happen to have her with us today. I said, we just happen to have her with us today. Why are you making me do this? Well, it was either that or you dress as one of Gem and the Holograms. Then you'd be truly, truly outrageous. Ugh, fine. I'll dress as Pat Benatar. Three, four. Hit me with your best shot. Why don't you hit me with your best shot? Just me, or does this sound like something else? I guess you're just what I need. I need, I need someone to feed me. Also, I don't think we can talk about the 1980s without talking about Chrissy Hyde and the Pretenders. Going my, 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 the agenda show. Cause I go make a scene. See, man, 1980s is a pretty kick ass year so far, ain't it? I gotta say, I'm pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. Even if the fashion leaves something to be desired. Ugh, how do you use... I can't use my phone with these gloves on. Just be thankful you're not using one of those old 80s phones, like uh, this one. Radio Shack Hi. keeps you in constant communication with their affordable, transportable cellular telephone. Wow. How do you tweet on that? It was also in 1980 when Bruce Springsteen had his first top 10 hit. Everybody's got a home which even John Lennon called a great record. And speaking of Lennon, he released his first solo album in five years, Double Fantasy. I still got this one on vinyl. Bye, my love. It'll be just like starting over. And it's a pretty solid album, except all the songs written by Yoko. But yeah, I gotta say, given all the great music that came out in 1980, it seemed like the decade was starting off in a cool new direction. I'm saying, here I am now. Did you get through it all? Wasn't the 70s a drag, you know? <laughs> Let's try and make the 80s good. We all survived Vietnam or Watergate, but the world is not like the 60s. Anymore. The whole map's changed, and we're going into an unknown future, but we're still all here. While there's life, there's hope. Former Beatle John Lennon, who was 40, was shot and killed last night outside his luxury apartment in New York. John Lennon's death has often been equated with the Kennedy assassination, given that so much of his music was about love, peace, brotherhood of man, and it became such a source of hope for so many people. The song is about people like him that have lived and died for the principle of unity for all people. For him to be gunned down in such a horrific way, it was like all hope had been lost. It's like uh, losing your parents or anybody you know and love. All things must pass. To me, he was one of the greatest men that ever walked this earth. He was a god to me. If he wasn't for John Lennon, we'd all be someplace very different to me. The world had lost one of its most inspiring rock and roll prophets. I love you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, do you guys want to listen to some Led Zeppelin? Try to cheer everything up? John Bonham also died in 1980, and the surviving members of Led Zeppelin decided not to carry on without their drummer. Why is it that whenever we do one of these episodes, there's always something to just bring the mood down? Well, rock and roll has to carry on like it always does. So we need to follow this with something new, something fresh, something uplifting, a truly innovative it's musical gonna force. It's going to be Tiny Tim again, isn't it? If you want my body and you think I'm sexy, come on, baby, let me know. Well, this certainly changed the mood. Uh, can we listen to somebody that doesn't sound like a chipmunk? 
Okay, this is not what I had in mind. No, 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 keep it going. I actually love this song. Yeah, me too. Moving Pictures by Rush. This is the album we've been waiting for. By the turn of the decade, many of the great progressive bands were starting to fade away. Pink Floyd was going through a bitter breakup, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer had already broken up, and Kansas was becoming a Christian rock band. So Rush really came out swinging in this decade, especially thanks to Neil Peart's drumming. Oh God, there is no drummer better than Neil Peart! Another veteran band of the 70s, Foreigner, hit number one in 1981 with the album Four. Also that same year, Stevie Nicks put out a solo album featuring a collaboration with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. What you doing? Even the Rolling Stones, now in their third decade together as a band, started up the 80s with a bang. Alright, alright, alright. Enough of those dinosaurs, man. I've been waiting three episodes to talk about hair metal. Five, actually. Oh, whatever. Let's talk about some Def Leppard. <laughs> is awesome. In fact, it started a second British invasion. Yes, the second British invasion. This one's even worse than the Rolling Stones. Look at this album, Pyromania, Fire and Crosshairs. This is clearly damaging to our impressionable children. Is there not anyone who will stand up against this crime against our children? There was. Her name was Tipper Gore. Wait, really? Tipper Gore? Wasn't that Al Gore's wife? I'm super serial. Yeah, Def Leppard would become just one of the filthy 15 that the Parents Music Resource Center would find objectionable. Oh, who cares about them? Let's just stick to the song. I mean, you gotta love Def Leppard, right? Well... In all honesty, I'm not a huge fan of hair metal, but the early 80s is when it was just starting and was still a new, fresh take on big stadium rock songs. It even sounds like they were taking ideas from the new wave to sprinkle on these heavy tracks. Like Van Halen, Quiet Riot was one of the bands to emerge from the LA hard rock scene and originally featured Randy Rhodes on guitar. Carlos Cavazzo took his place at the turn of the decade. He had originally written Mental Health with the band Snow, which was originally called No More Booze. You can hear it on their album At Last. But rewritten in Quiet Riot, Metal Health became a rock anthem. Again though, what is up with this video? Listen, if all you want to see is a great band rocking out on stage, we gotta check out Iron Maiden. Well, I am a fan of Twin Guitarmony. Oh, and Bruce Dickinson? Yes, the Bruce Dickinson. Was a great showman. He's the one that proved that rock and roll is a real man's genre. Excuse me? You may have forgotten, we talked about her in the 70s, but Joan Jett is about as hardcore 80s rock as you can get. Come on! Joan Jett and the Blackhearts! Actually, the story behind Joan Jett is pretty unique. Even with her notoriety from The Runaways, she was rejected by 23 major record labels, all with the same mentality that girls don't play rock and roll. So she formed her own record label, Black Heart Records. We printed up, I think, like 5,000 records and sold them out of the trunk of the car after the shows. Does that technically make her an indie rocker? Uh, I mean, I guess it kind of does. Who cares? Joan Jett's a badass! Well, as 
long as we're talking about hardcore punk, how about other indie bands from California, like The Descendants or Black Flag? Guns, guns, try to roll. Rock, up, we're gonna rock up. I mean, look at this video. It's practically a prototype for the 90s. And we can't talk about punk without mentioning The Clash's combat rock. That was their biggest album. Come on, let me know. Yeah, I have to admit, I'm not as into combat rock as I am their earlier work, but it was the last to feature the classic Clash lineup and featured some rock and roll gems. You've probably noticed by now that a lot of these songs have very distinct music videos associated with them. We've seen visual representations of classic songs pretty much since the beginning, but at the turn of the decade, avant-garde groups like the Talking Heads really started to experiment with visualizing their records. Music videos had previously been featured on programs like Pop Clips, one of the first shows on Nickelodeon, but on August 1st, 1981, a new TV channel played a music video for Video Killed the Radio Star by The Buggles, which is probably the most perfect song to premiere with. Video can you name another song by The Buggles? Nope, nobody can. I can name the second video they played, You Better Run by Pat Benatar. You better run! You better and thus, a new era of television dedicated to music videos was created. Music television, or MTV. MTV? I know everything about MTV. Why are you here again? I'm here talking about MTV. There it is, right there. Now starting right now, you'll never look at music the same way again. MTV was this wacky thing that came up. All of a sudden there had to be a video for every piece of music. MTV really made rock and roll a visual medium. They would get a bunch of guys who look good or a pretty girl. The image of the song was the band. You know, I actually, this is not a joke, I tried out to be the sixth VJ on MTV. You know, to be like one of these dipshits. So I go into the meeting, there's all these people, and they said to me, well, you know, with MTV being a VJ, you have to know everything about what's going on in music. And I said, well, when I, to be honest, when I watch them, it doesn't look like they know what the next word that's coming out of their mouth is. That was the end of the interview. I didn't get the job. But I did do a show in the 80s, and here it is. You want to see it? Not really. Well, you're gonna. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Disaster Peace Theater. And now, here's your host, Sal U. Lloyd. Welcome to Disaster Peace Theater, the program that dares to be bad. I'm Sal U. Lloyd, and we're presenting a very interesting motion picture tonight. Now, I know we had a little mix-up last week about... Hey, what's going on here? Okay, celluloid, this is your producer speaking. Get out of here! <laughs> You're an insane <laughs> maniac! That's so You're a good. lunatic! Why aren't you I laughing? Mean, I don't know what's wrong with you! What anyway, you the, the, the birth of MTV dad? really coincided with the new wave movement. Time is short, the life is cool, but it's up to us to change! While some of these bands in the second British invasion, like The Jam or Billy Idol, were very prolific. It's a nice day for a white wedding. Most of these bands on MTV were one-hit wonders. In fact, there's so many one-hit wonder new wave bands of the 80s, it would take way too long to go through them all. I'll stop the world with you. Not to mention, they're also very synth-driven. In the previous decade, synth-pop was really starting to gain momentum in Germany. David Bowie had moved to Berlin to collaborate with Brian Eno on his next few albums, incorporating layers of synthesizers. It 
was a huge influence on the New Wave movement, and as MTV was really gaining momentum in 1983, synth-driven songs like Men Without Hats' Safety Dance were played in heavy rotation. Cause your friends don't dance, and if they don't dance, well, they're no friends of mine. What, what the hell is this? The band is called Men Without Hats, and yet there's clearly a man wearing a hat. That's false advertising. Not necessarily. The band is called Men Without Hats, you know, men in the plural sense. Technically, there's only one man with a hat. Good point. Actually, some of these early MTV videos are just strange. Do you come from a land down under? I mean, they're entertaining to watch and just how dated and ridiculous they are. And fortunately, you can watch a lot of them now on YouTube, but at the time, if I can borrow a phrase from James Rolfe, what were they thinking? There was a video by Yes, where the whole thing was like upside down. A friend of mine had edited it and premiered and uh, was at my parents' house and my little nephew was there. And as we were watching it, he stood on his head and looked at it so he would see it right side up. A funny thing to me is if you look at those videos now, they haven't been preserved very well because I guess they didn't think they would have longevity. All right, as much as I like a lot of these new wave bands, I gotta get away from synthesizers for a while and hear some raw rock and roll. Yeah, I agree with you on that, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait. Are we not going to talk about Cindy Lauper? Okay, I gotta go now. I gotta go buy a lottery ticket on my way to the uh, institution I stay at. So, see you later. I'll be a rich man pretty soon. You know what? Let's get back to the band that really helped kick off the New Wave movement with their cool guitar riffs and their reggae grooves, yeah, yeah. The Police! Yeah. Okay, I, I guess the police want to jump on the synthesizer bandwagon as well. Hey, isn't that the same album that Every Breath You Take came out of? Every Breath You Take. Oh, yeah. This video in particular was played in heavy rotation on MTV and became their biggest hit by far. Every night you stay, I'll be watching you. Hey, if it's hard rock you want, let's get to some journey, man. They're gonna come in with some great guitar riffs and... Or they can do synth, you know, fine, whatever, but hey. Journey had Steve Perry. Steve Perry. And Steve Perry is one of the greatest singers in all of rock and roll. You, one night will remind you Oh, it don't start when I say the way Even if he looked pretty ridiculous in the music video. Well, Journey had a ton of hits. You had Any Way You Want It, Faithfully. Just, just don't mention that one song, all right? Well, which, which one? You know which one I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Hey, where did she go? I don't... Oh. Don't stop! But, hey, since when did you become Tony Soprano? Can you not play that song in my house? Hey! That song is a classic! It was a classic before it started being played at every cover gig ever. Now I want to hear some Bruce Springsteen. Oh yeah, like nobody's ever covered a Bruce Springsteen song. Yeah, but I know that Bruce isn't going to start with some cheesy synth opening. Oh, Bruce, not you too! Ronald Reagan wanted to use Born in the USA as his campaign song? Mr. Springsteen, tear down this wall. Which is weird, considering the song is about how his administration mistreated Vietnam vets. It is true that Bruce's blue collar roots are still all over this album, but it still sounds like a sellout to me. Even if we're just dancing in the dark. Aw, Bruce, what have they done to you, man? They got you dancing around the stage like Carlton from The Fresh Prince. Isn't there anybody in the 80s playing good old fashioned rock and roll and blues music? <laughs> Yes. 
Ah, Stevie Ray, you were such a beacon of light in the 80s. I'm serious, people. Steve Ray Vaughan is one of the best guitar players of all time. And at a time when MIDI was starting to take over actual performance in studios, Stevie Ray pretty much stuck to playing Texas blues or Hendrix-inspired rock tunes. <laughs> In fact, there was something of a blues revival in the 80s. But I was bad alone. And yes, it's impossible for me to hear this song without thinking about Terminator 2. Still going with those 90s movies references, huh? Yeah, I am. Another blues rock band from Texas, ZZ Top, were very popular in the 80s. In fact, I think my earliest musical memory is listening to ZZ Top's Rough Boy. Even Clapton came back to playing the epic guitar solos he made famous in the 60s. had the members of Toto backing him up on a couple of tunes. Toto was comprised of some of the best session players of the time. Jeff Beccaro, David Page, and another guitar virtuoso, Steve Lukather. If we're talking about great guitar players of the 80s, we gotta talk about Van Halen. Pick any tune, any tune, and they're gonna come out with a face-melting guitar riff. What the hell? Now he's playing synth? Well, he has other songs. Eddie, how could you? Well, what are you gonna do next? Play on a Michael Jackson record? Oh. I do love Eddie's solo on Beat It, although I always hated that he wasn't included in the MTV video. Hell, even Weird Al featured his guitar player, Jim West, for Eat It in explosive fashion. <laughs> I gotta talk about this. Ladies and gentlemen, I think Michael Jackson is overrated. <gasps> I like some of the Jackson 5 stuff, and I actually think Off the Wall is his best album, thanks in part to Quincy Jones' production. It's also worth mentioning that Jackson was one of the first black artists to be featured on MTV, along with Prince. Now, Prince is definitely not overrated, and I would love to play some tracks from Purple Rain. However, Prince's stuff is tightly controlled by copyright, so... I'm not doing the pictures joke. Not until you explain why you dislike MJ. Yeah. He made Thriller. Thriller? Thriller is the best-selling album of all time. The video, directed by John Landis, was an event much like the Beatles on The Ed Sullivan Show. So, much like Stairway to Heaven, Thriller was just overexposed, but there's something else that always bothered me about the video. I do like the song Thriller itself, okay, even if it borrows heavily from Rick James' Give It To Me Baby. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. But whereas previous music videos felt like they were providing a visual representation of the song, this is an instance where the song itself is being carved up to fit the format of the video. I've never liked that all the verses are jumbled together and then having to wait for this long dance sequence before finally getting to the chorus where MJ gets to show off what he does best. Even if I can barely understand what he's singing. Again, referring to Prince, Purple Rain had a much stronger emotional connection to the music, and that was a full movie. Thriller just comes off like a universal ride. Technically well made, but whatever edge the original song had, it just feels like it's not here. Dude! Thriller is the greatest music video to have ever graced the presence of this planet! I know. It completely reinvented the music video as an art form! I know! I've heard that a million times! But as far as I'm concerned, this is the moment when everything goes horribly wrong! 
And it's actually not really MJ's fault. It's totally a movie. It's the industry. While this trend started in the 70s, Thriller is when the industry started chasing that next blockbuster. When it became more important to have a gimmicky music video on MTV rather than writing a well-crafted song or album. Remember when the Dire Straits were this unique band featuring Mark Knopfler's virtuoso finger picking? Well, in 1985, they actually wrote a synth-driven pop song featuring Sting singing, I want my MTV. Now I should confess that I actually love this song. It probably has something to do with me listening to it as a baby. Admittedly, it's hard not to think of the famous visuals associated with these songs. Yeah, even movies were a big part of that. You can't listen to The Simple Minds' Don't You Forget About Me without thinking of The Breakfast Club, or Huey Lewis and the News' Power of Love without thinking of Back to the Future. That's the power of love. In fact, maybe one of the most loved music videos of all time is AHA's Take On Me. And it is a great video, one that perfectly captures the mood of the song. And of course, you can always count on Pink Floyd for stunning visuals in their videos, who had now regrouped without Roger Waters. But for every take on me or learning to fly, there was Rock Me Tonight by Billy Squire. God, this is awful. This is actually considered one of the worst music videos ever made. It destroyed Billy Squire's career. I hate to tell you this, man, but there were a lot of videos like that. Take Tears for Fears, for example. Songs from the Big Chair is one of my favorite albums of the decade, particularly their classic ballad, Head Over Heels. It's a masterpiece, really, but the video feels so far removed from the emotional context of the song. Why are they in a library? Why is that woman wearing a gas mask? Why is there a monkey reading a book? What does any of this have to do with Head Over Heels? You think that's bad? Have you seen Bonnie Tyler's total eclipse of the fart? I, I, I mean, heart. No, you were, you were right the first time. Together we can take it to the end of the line. The love is like a shadow on the all of the time. All of the time. This video is all over the place with some metaphorical storyline that I'm not smart enough to understand. It includes, in no particular order, male swimmers, a weird glowing-eyed schoolboy, phantom doves, dancing ninjas, the angel from Tony Kushner's Angels in America, demon-possessed Mormon tabernacle choir, and nearly naked diaper-clad men dancing around Bonnie Tyler. Cocaine's a hell of a drug. While we're at it, we might as well talk about Madonna hey. and like- No! 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 Do not play anything by Madonna! <laughs> it's already playing! <laughs> What is wrong with you? Madonna was the queen of media. She sparked debate and controversy with songs such as Like a Virgin and Papa Don't Preach. Papa don't preach. Papa the famous MJ crotch grab from Express Yourself, it was a celebration of women taking ownership of their sexuality. Oh, well, I certainly like watching her do it more than I do Billy Squire. Look, I'm clearly not the target audience for Madonna. And at the time, this was very provocative and groundbreaking from a visual perspective. But I always felt like the music didn't reflect this edgy, sex-driven vibe she was trying to get across. That's not really the case with Tina Turner or Prince. Their music was oozing with sexuality and it felt more like it complemented the performance. <laughs> Or take someone like Annie Lennox from the Eurythmics, whose androgynous nature, I think, was far more groundbreaking at the time. Some of them want to use you. Some of them want to get used by you. My problem is that Madonna pretty much set this industry standard that image was more important than artistry. That's why someone like Annie Wilson, who was belting out some of the best rock vocal tracks of the decade, didn't get the same kind of recognition. Now, my own. And 
Karen Wilson had gained weight and the record company went out of their way to hide her image or shoot her in close shots for their videos. You know guys, I think we're getting a little off track here. I mean, this is the history of rock and roll, not the history of pop music videos. So let's talk about one of the best albums of the decade. In 1986, the album Slippery When Wet was released by Jersey band Bon Jovi. Some of you might have heard of them. Hey, that's my line. Shut up! living on a prayer. Does it get any more epic than this? From John Bon Jovi's screaming vocal to Richie Sambora's talk box and the lyrics echoing Springsteen's blue collar influence, this is one of the greatest songs ever written. sing that song at every cover gig ever, and I am not about to sing it in my own house! Bon Jovi is a good band. I actually like their first single, Runaway, the best. She's a little runaway. But honestly, when I was listening to Slippery When Wet again for this show, even on the cassette tape, it's really overproduced for my tastes. Their lyrics, for the most part, are very cliched, and it's really a point where hair metal started to become a parody of itself. I mean, this is post Spinal Tap, which ridiculed every ridiculous spectacle driven aspect of rock and roll. Yeah, overproduce this, overproduce that, you're overproduced! What does that even mean? Hey, 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 okay. Why don't we just listen to something else, like the final countdown? Uh, <laughs> synth intro ever? Yeah, but once the intro is over, so is the song. It's the same corporate production, the same vocal style, same image, same everything. <sighs> oh, that's it! Looks like I have to bring out the big guns. You forced my hand, I hope you're happy. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the best album of all time, Guns N' Roses! <laughs> oh! Appetite for friggin' destruction! In the jungle, Think, man. Meh. But it's it's the greatest album ever. I said meh. N E H. Meh. How can you call yourself a rock and roll fan and not like Guns N' Roses? Axel Rose is their lead singer. Okay, fair enough. I will say this about Appetite for Destruction. It's a great sounding record. It's definitely a step in the right direction sonically. The drums, bass, and guitar, while huge, sound much more organic. Slash's solos are much more melodic and a great addition to every song. Axel, his reputation aside, is a powerful singer. Fortunately, a lot of aspiring bands took note of this record and would come back with their own version of this heavy sound in the 90s. Okay, so what performance do you like from the 80s? I like when Queen played Live Aid. Live Aid was organized by Bob Geldof as a sort of global jukebox to aid famine in Africa. The largest pop concert ever held with the greatest audience. It was one of the largest global broadcasts in history, almost two billion people. I think maybe we should go right down to the stage, Duran Duran live on MTV. And at the center of it all was Queen performing one of the most famous sets in rock and roll history. Ayo! Ayo! 
I mean, this is just amazing. It's just Freddie, a microphone, and a crowd of 70,000 people singing a cappella with them. But there were obviously plenty of other performances from this event. We the people demand the unconditional release of Nelson Mandela! Miami Steve Van Zant had left Springsteen's E Street Band to focus on his own politically charged career. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Which included the all-star protest against apartheid, Sun City. In fact, it was their performance at Live Aid that really made U2 household names. Oh, God, U2. I would make the South Park reference, but, you know, we already did it. Yeah, I'm not really their biggest fan. <sighs> Don't tell me you like U2. I like U2. I told you not to tell me that. Not to mention albums like War were very politically charged. These guys grew up in Ireland at a time still plagued by the Troubles, so they sang about it. And their entire body of work in the 80s is pretty solid, culminating with the Joshua Tree. How can you like you too, but not care about Bon Jovi or Guns N' oh, Roses? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm what sorry they're not a bunch of corporate sellouts like all those other stupid brands that you're like, just hey, 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 I am out of goldfish. Go to the store and get me more goldfish. Why do I? Why do I got my own goldfish? Okay, okay, okay. Jeez. Now, maybe this corporate rock stuff is a little too much to take in all at once. So how about we listen to some alternative rock? Let me go. Blister in the Sun by the Violent Femmes. That's a fun tune. Who doesn't know this classic 80s song, right? Well, technically it didn't become popular until the 1990s when it was used oh, in TV and movies. You and your 90s TV and movies. Alternative rock was just a label that gave underground bands signing to independent labels. <laughs> Some of these bands, like the Pixies, would be very influential on future alt-rockers to come. The Replacements, too. They were even banned for life from Saturday Night Live because, well, they're the Replacements. We are the sons of no one. Alternative rock was enjoying some success in England with bands like the Smiths. And of course, How Soon Is Now practically became a goth anthem from Love Split Love's cover being included in The Craft. Again, with your 90s movies. And hey, if you're gonna talk about goth rock, make sure you include The Cure this time. Oh, I am way ahead of you. While frontman Robert Smith adopted this gothic persona for their early albums, By the late 80s, they were starting to gain footing with more commercial hits. Show me, show me, show me how you do that trick. The one that makes me scream, she said. And of course, he later saved South Park from the monstrous Mecha Streisand. Disintegration is the best album ever! While the Cure songs were topping the charts in England, in America, the biggest alternative band of the late 80s was R.E.M. This one goes out to... Michael Stipe with hair is kind of weird. Yeah, it is. And while we're at it, there was a certain band from Seattle that released their first record in 1989. But we'll get to them next time. Oh, I want to talk about them now! Listen, if it's dark, depressing rock you want, I got that in spades. Thrash metal roll call! Slayer! Anthrax! 
Megadeth. Metallica! But seriously, all these bands rock so hard. And it's kind of funny how they're connected in little ways. Like Dave Mustaine was the original guitarist for Metallica but left to form Megadeth, and their rivalry was kind of similar to what the Beatles and the Rolling Stones had in the 60s. Megadeth made So Far So Good So What? And six months later, Metallica released Injustice For All. Now, I don't think rock and roll can get much heavier than that, now can it? It is true that these bands were savage and proud of it. Most of the thrash metal pioneers came from LA, though honestly I feel like the UK bands like Judas Priest and Motorhead were already developing these fast, heavy grooves at the turn of the decade. The only gun I need is the Aces Fate. Lyrics and thrash metal are obviously dark, but Slayer took it to a whole different level. Let's listen to their song Angel of Death, which had the record company running scared to release it. Oh, hell yeah! Ready to hear lead singer Tom Arara? 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 You wanna hear him scream? <laughs> It should be noted that these lyrics are clearly going more for shock value rather than being sympathetic to Nazis. But honestly, sometimes thrash metal was so distorted and so fast it didn't even sound like music anymore. I do appreciate these bands pushing the boundaries of what they could do with their instruments or what they were allowed to sing about. We've come a long way from Jerry Lee Lewis singing Great Balls of Fire, and in my estimation, many of these metal bands would really find their groove in the 90s. It was also cool when Anthrax collaborated with Public Enemy on Bring the Noise. Of course, it wasn't the first time a rock band and rap group teamed up. Run DMC's reinvention of Aerosmith's Walk This Way gave hip hop a whole new audience and brought Aerosmith back into the limelight. Boys, they were a rock rap group. You gotta fight for your right to party. I haven't talked too much about hip hop, but the irony is that at a time when rock and roll was seen as passe, groups like Public Enemy really seemed to take up the reins of rebellious underground music. And speaking of rebellious music, let's get back to Tipper Gore and her filthy 15. When last we left her, she had formed the PMRC to force record companies to place parental advisory labels on records like We're Not Gonna Take It by Twisted Sister. Why this song? because supposedly it promoted violence. There's songs about rape, thrill killing, uh, sadomasochism. I don't know. I mean, after listening to stuff like Public Enemy and Slayer, this sounds kind of tame. Well, interesting enough, D. Snyder actually testified before the Senate opposing these parental guidance labels. Songs allow a person to put their own imagination, experiences, and dreams into the lyrics. People can interpret it many ways. Ms. Gore was looking for sadomasochism and bondage, and she found it. Unfortunately, their best efforts were to no avail. Many records now contain sexually explicit warnings on the label. Did the parental advisory sticker stop you from listening to explicit content? No. Did it stop you? Um, like, no. Didn't stop me either. 
What it did do was force big chains like Walmart to remove any albums containing the label, thus forcing record labels to censor their artists or even edit their content for MTV. I'm tired of running into kids on the street who tell me that they can't play our records anymore because of the misinformation their parents are being fed by the PMRC. For hip hop groups and metal bands, it was almost like a badge of honor. But for mainstream rock, it really took the angst out of the music. You can tell with Def Leppard's next album, the difference in vibe. In some ways, this had to do with the production catering to drummer Rick Allen, who had lost his arm in a car accident. And believe me, this guy is a legend for carrying on with only one arm. But the vibe was just so much more overblown than their previous album. And then there's Poison. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what the 90s generation rebelled against. Corporate, excessive, overproduced hair metal rock. Also, the obligatory power ballad had long worn out its welcome. I'm not playing it. Man, you suck! Really, the late 80s is a very dark period of music history. I do have a nostalgic soft spot for artists like Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown. Don't know where the cars may fall. Although this clip has not aged well. Also, Living Color emerged at this time, combining hard rock, funk, jazz, and they were true musicians. But you also had artists like Paula Abdul, and no, I'm not making an American Idol joke, who further proved that spectacle was more important than substance. Try to fight it, but I'm telling you, Jack, it's useless. I'm a sense of track. Baby, ain't it something how it lasted this long? Hey, I'll have you know I loved this song as a kid. Why is she dancing with a rapping cat? Well, you see, it's because, uh... Because, uh... A magical beat! Still got it. I think the final nail in the coffin came when Millie Vanilli had two good-looking European models who couldn't sing, miming to a pre-made track. Especially when the record started skipping live on stage. Now, admittedly, this is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Until you remember that they had their Grammy withdrawn and frontman Rob Pilatus killed himself in 1998. But it did prove to record companies that even if their artists couldn't sing, image was more important. Come on, it's not all bad. George Harrison had a couple of hits at the end of the decade. Reputation's changeable. The Traveling Wilburys, George Harrison, Jeff Lynne, Roy Orbison, Tom Petty, and Bob Dylan for some reason, but that's an amazing supergroup right there. Bob said, well, what's it going to be called, George? I witnessed him look over at the crate and look back and say, oh, it's, it's handled with care. <laughs> they even participated on Tom Petty's Full Moon Fever album. Traveling Wilburys album is a masterpiece of a record. It's just a shame that Roy Orbison died very shortly after they made it. Anything at all, you got it. All right, I got one last trick up my sleeve. I <laughs> like that little play on words. Motley Crue. <gasps> Molly Crew's Dr. Feel Good, led by bassist and songwriter Nikki Six, in between his heroin sessions. It's an awesome album. Come on, man, you've got to agree with me on this. It's a good album. Thank you. But I've got something even better to end this video with. A song that points to rock and roll's future. Rockin' in the free world. And I got this one on Compact Disc. Compact Disc? <laughs> Come on, man. CDs are nothing compared to the majesty of cassettes. Let's see. Track number 12. 
Wow, that was easy. Ah, Neil, you always end the decade with a bang. <sighs> and this song harks back to what rock and roll is really about. Real drums, heavy distorted guitars, and lyrics about what an asshole George Bush is. The, the first George Bush. And a thousand points of light. We got a thousand points of light for the homeless man. While the future of rock and roll may have looked pretty bleak, rockin' in the free world is at least one spark of angst-ridden rock to close out the 80s with. Okay, fine, I'll agree with you on that. But I think it's time for the end question. Did the 80s rock hard? No! What? What, what do you mean, yes? No. Oh my god. You had all this new technology, a new platform to showcase your band, and you're in that glorious age of excess. Why not rock out harder, crazier, and just be way more dazzling than the last decade? But it's all so calculated. The change of rock and roll into a visual medium forced bands and record companies alike to cater to this extravagant image of what rock and roll had become. It was such a slap in the face to the original decades. I'll show you a slap in the face! <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh. <sighs> you know, on retrospect, I'm kinda regretting this decision. Well, this was bound to happen eventually. Should've done this a long time ago. Your show would be nothing without me, and you know it! Um, boys? Hey? Hey? I got a text. Uh, it's from that annoying hippie bum. Ugh, what does he want? Dear stupid bums, I have won the lottery what? and have moved to San Diego. What? I even bought myself a mobile beach chair. How did he win the lottery and move to San Diego all while we were talking about the 80s? It's YouTube logic or video editing. I don't even know anymore. But I wanted to let you know that despite its dumber moments, the 80s did rock hard in certain ways. I think it's I hard think it's sometimes. I think it's hard sometimes we try to encapsulate things by decades. The 80s kind of began with the new wave stuff and it gave us some 
pretty good artist. And then we kind of got into these hair bands that were pretty ridiculous, but some of them were good. Bon Jovi, Van Halen, but then we ended up with U2. I mean, that was an incredible band. They're still going. And we keep going back and forth. Just when you think music is dead, the new wave comes out and all of a sudden there's that emotion. That's what rock and roll is all about. Oh, I mean, I guess he's right. Music tastes are all subjective. There's still music where you can really just sit down and listen to it and the record is great. But when you start commercializing rock and roll, it's no longer about rebelling. It's about who's the loudest, who's the weirdest, who has the funniest haircut, the funniest dance. I mean, the 80s was kind of a mess, but like a beautiful disaster kind of mess. Anyway, enjoy your stupid YouTube show. I'm going to the beach. Screw you all. Love, Joseph. Joseph? You know, to be honest, I actually was surprised how much I enjoyed going through a lot of this music. And I still maintain that it didn't rock quite as hard as other decades, but the best thing to do is find the music you like and filter out the stuff you don't. Well, I guess that's the closest we'll ever come to agreeing. Why don't we head back, brush up on our 90s rock for the next episode? Now you're talking my language. <laughs> yeah! Um, should it, shouldn't you two be checked into a hospital? You both just beat each other up for the last two minutes. Oh, uh, I, I think we're going to be fine. fine. There's fine. nothing wrong. 300 Jennifer Real Monster.